seminar series, and it's really great to be here with um, all of you today. Um, so um, I'll go ahead and get started. So um, this will just be kind of an idiosyncratic introduction to tensor network methods and um, taking the perspective of um, progress really over the um, last 30 years, um, you know, major progress in kind of diving into the structure of quantum wave functions, realizing that that these kind of forbidding objects of quantum wave functions actually have a lot of structure and um, that ideas around that are still bearing fruit today. Um, so we'll go through sort of the basics of that. And then um, I'll conclude by really focusing on um, a particular way of dealing with finite temperature quantum systems through the viewpoint of, of wave functions with the structure kind of to tee off the next talk um, by Alex, which will focus a lot more on particular applications to the um, Hubbard model. Um, so if you went, if you rolled back 30 years and um, we're thinking about quantum wave functions, you might think about them as really kind of a bit of a pie in the sky, you know, kind of fictitious type of, of thing that you wouldn't really actually want to deal with on the computer. And that's because just by like a simple counting that we'll go over a few more, more times, um, these are really um, in their kind of raw form, just these unimaginably vast things, these unimaginably vast objects. So if you actually had um, just 140 quantum particles, like 140 electrons, and you tried to describe every possible state they could be in um, without any kind of approximation or any kind of consideration about whether they're at high temperature or low temperature or anything like that, you would need um, more numbers than there actually are atoms in the known universe. So it's just a hopeless thing to, to think about even doing. Um, but it turns out that, um, and of course this has been long been known, but wasn't always appreciated as like something that could be harnessed numerically, that um, actually there's quantum entanglement between particles and that this quantum entanglement is something like a limited resource. So, um, so it, it cannot be that really every possible um, one of these numbers, you know, that I showed a minute ago means something totally different, but it wasn't, you know, a priori obvious how to really like take this idea and turn it into something um, very useful for calculations. But it turns out that um, these entanglement patterns actually are very tied to um, the locality of interactions that's present in, in most systems and to dimensionality. And um, it actually like kind of stamps or imprints an internal structure to the wave function, um, which is specific to those properties, but also highly generic and can let us kind of take, um, take quantum physics on sort of in these broad swaths where we consider, you know, all low temperature states in one dimension or all low temperature states in two dimensions or all critical states and things in these very big chunks. And yet, um, uh, not only can we understand these things in kind of a classification sense, but these um, drawings, which I'll explain in more detail later, these tensor networks, they're also something like actual computer programs that you can run. Um, and then you can use this to build powerful numerical tools. So it's a really kind of beautiful story and I'll just walk you through some pieces of that. So um, we began by thinking about um, you know, the task of mini body quantum physics. And um, here in this series of lectures, we're particularly interested in mini electron systems. Um, and these are you know, very important because there's this um, interesting and ongoing story, for example, about understanding unconventional superconductors, which don't obey the you know, BCS paradigm, which was laid down a while ago, um, but superconduct at much higher temperatures than, than you would think from that paradigm. And um, so to try to make progress in, in, on systems like that, um, you know, it's been understood or hoped that we could just simplify and simplify and simplify and kind of break this problem down to its essence. So, you know, one simplification is that you uh, might focus on two dimensional planes of these um, superconducting materials and then um, create models of various complexity to try to understand whether these simple models can, can capture most of the story. Here's a recent paper actually by um, Steve White, who's one of the pioneers of this whole field that I'll be talking about where they're able to see some of the features um, uh, you know, realized generically across these ITC systems um, in a you know, rather simple model called the TET prime J model that's not too far away from the Hubbard model. But, but very often we're just interested in the simplest model of all in terms of the um, kind of minimal number of processes that you can have and still expect the right physics. Um, so that's the Hubbard model where you just have the motion of electrons from one atom to another um, encoded here in this um, tunneling T, and then a um, on-site interaction penalty U when two electrons occupy the same orbital. So this is just kind of to set up the kind of problems that we're thinking about applying um, these tools to. And um, now we'll kind of you know, go off into a pretty mathematical direction to talk about this whole setting of, of mini-body quantum physics. And from, this very, from a very high level, if you weren't very computationally minded, you might think that this all looks really simple because you have this Hamiltonian, it's well-defined, 
thing. It's basically a sum of small matrices that are producted together. Um, and then all we have to do is if we want to study quantum systems at zero temperature, then all we have to do is just find an eigenvector of this, of this matrix H. Or if we want to study things that at finite temperature, all we have to do is exponentiate this matrix H um, with some factor that encodes the temperature. And this gives us the state. Um, we either get the zero temperature state psi or the finite temperature state rho properly normalized. And then we just um, trace these with operators to compute basically anything we want. Um, so that, that seems simple enough. So where's the problem in all this? The problem is that this, this matrix H, which looks so you know, innocuous on this slide, um, actually lives in the space of all configurations. Here I'm just showing um, for simplicity, just, just spins, but really we have electrons that can be in four different states. They could be in any orbital, no electrons and up and down or, or both an up and a down in a given orbital. And likewise, the wave function psi is also defined in this space of all configurations, which is an exponentially big space. So, you know, we have every possible configuration of, of n electrons um, and, you know, that's an exponentially big number. So that's a really hopelessly large number that, that gets back to that really large number I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. So this just seems like a very um, fictitious and imaginary object from that point of view. And this is one way that we could uh, define the many body problem to say that the many body problem from this wave function point of view is that we're forced to work in this exponentially large space where you can't even um, begin the problem. You can't even choose even an initial guess for psi and even store it on your computer at all or anything like that um, when it's th this large. So for, you know, people realized this of course a long time ago and said, um, okay, wave functions are just a way of setting up the formalism, but we have to then immediately get around them somehow. We can't really work with quantum physics this way, um, at least not for large many body problems. So what were some of the things people have done and continue to do to deal with this problem? Um, and some of these are still bearing a lot of fruit. Um, others are just very interesting historical stories. Uh, one of them that actually can work very occasionally, and in fact um, happened in the case of tensor networks back in the 80s as well, is that you can kind of intuit or guess the wave function in certain special cases. So one of the most famous cases is um, the fractional quantum Hall effect, where you can actually write the wave function down as just some kind of beautiful um, complex, you know, function taking complex parameters, which you know encode locations of of excitations of the system. And then this can work beautifully for a wide range of physics. Another example I don't have a slide about is, is in the 80s, there's this famous wave function called the AKLT state, where you can exactly write down a tensor network. This was before these were even really considered a, a mainstream topic that encodes a certain interesting many body state. Um, a much more common thing to do is just to say that the wave function is not really an appropriate ob object to do computation on. In fact, I, I think it was Cohn had some very strong opinions about this. and um, so instead, you just think of it as a mathematical structure, and you come up with a totally different way of encoding quantum physics. And, and the most successful of these, for sure, is density functional theory, which was laid down in the 70s, and then it's been turned into a very powerful computational tool. Um, what you can prove is that really some very simple properties derived from the wave function, basically just the electron density, um, really actually are one-to-one -to, -one to all other properties you would want to know about an electron system. And um, starting from this viewpoint, you can, um, you can solve systems of uniform that are uniform and then sort of patch them together in what's called the local density approximation. And um, basically understand many electron systems as sort of local patches of uniform gases that are each interacting. And um, then this, this you know, can be applied to very big, very realistic systems and is still a workhorse today. So this works really great, but um, the problem is you put it in this approximation and then it's a bit hard to refine and sort of get it out of, of the problem after that, you're a bit stuck with it. Um, other things that are done quite much more often to deal with strongly correlated systems, which you can essentially think of as, as being defined as systems for which this scheme, DFT, doesn't work so well, um, that people are still doing are saying that um, there's certain important um, but very simple classes of wave functions. In particular for electrons, you have what are called Slater determinants, which are really um, product wave functions where essentially every electron is just kind of doing its own thing in its own orbital. Um, these are very easy to work with on the computer. And then it's correct to say that more general interacting wave functions can be written as a sum of these. Um, so then you can um, come up with various uh, sophisticated numerical schemes to work out the coefficients of the sum and also the right orbitals to put the electrons in. And this can work very, very well and is used heavily in, in chemistry applications. Um, and, and last but not least, you can try sampling the wave function. You can actually do a formal rewriting of, of quantum states as um, large integrals 
in what's called imaginary time most often. And this is, this is very much close to the idea of like a path integral formulation of quantum mechanics. And um, for the purpose of putting things on a computer, this is now a classical problem, one that you can um, you know, kind of think of as like the motion of uh, classical polymers or something like that. And then use Monte Carlo, just essentially classical Monte Carlo techniques repurposed in this setting to sample the way over the wave function. Um, so all these methods can work really well in their own um, domains and continue to work well, but they all also encounter some kind of trouble or limitation. Um, and this really just shows, um, as like my colleague uh, Olivier Parcolet always likes to say, is that the many body problem is an exponential problem. There's always an exponential hiding somewhere wherever you go. Um, so in the case of this summing idea, the exponential manifests that um, as you say, study the Hubbard model, if you increase u more and more, eventually you're going to need exponentially many terms in this sum, at starting at some moderate u and increasing, you know, to, to arbitrarily large u. Um, or in the case of this sampling scheme, this quantum Monte Carlo that I showed on the previous slide, um, things can work really well at, at high t and moderate temperature t, but then as you go to lower and lower temperature, eventually for most systems, you start needing exponentially many samples to get good statistics. That's called the sign problem. So that, that happens very generically for those kinds of, of methods. So then this brings us back to, to get around these problems, because this is really precisely where some of the most interesting physics happens is with significant interactions and at low temperature, maybe not zero temperature, but you know, low enough temperatures. Um, we don't want to have these problems. We can't be stopped by an exponential wall. So maybe the, you know, maybe the uh, key is to go back to try to handle the wave function, since after all, that's, that's sort of the fundamental object in which the problem is formulated. So then we can um, you know, take a detour in a bit of philosophy and just how to think about the wave function that, that might kind of tee up why uh, tensor methods um, are a good way to deal with them. Um, so we can think of a wave function as a map that um, just you know, takes in configurations and spits out numbers. Um, so you know, for every configuration, we assign a number, could be um, negative or complex, and we square it to get the probability of that configuration. Um, you know, viewing it this way, um, helps us to think about the wave function or the amplitudes of it, at least where all the parameters that describe it live, really formally as a tensor within indices. And I'm not gonna get way into the definition of a tensor, but basically you can just think of it as, as this, as this kind of machine that eats these configurations and maps them to numbers. And um, as I've mentioned a few times, when you have a tensor of this size, it has exponentially many parameters. We have um, N indices, each one is dimension four, you have four to the N parameters. So again, this is where we, we get back to this exponentially many parameter problem. Um, but when you start thinking about things in terms of tensors, um, you can start thinking about tensor factorizations and tensor decompositions. And, um, and, you, and often tensors have a lot of structure that people are learning to exploit in this field. And the idea behind this is you say, um, this is really a huge number of parameters that describes just an impossibly many different you know, set of things that can happen. Can these be truly unrelated? Um, if they are related, how can we actually take advantage of that on a computer in some way? So I'll take kind of a funny detour to, to motivate how we can do this. Um, we can actually take inspiration during the pandemic from watching Netflix. We could, we could think about um, how do the people at Netflix actually tell us what movies we would like when we haven't watched them? How do they actually do this? And the key to this is they actually use something close to tensor factorizations. So the idea here is that um, you know, they know, people have thought about this, that there's really millions of people, say, watching movies, but they've only ever rated a very small handful of them. Um, but we know that there can't really be um, a million unique different tastes in movies. It can't be that every row of this matrix encodes something utterly different from every other person who's ever been born and has ever liked or watched movies or had some opinion about them. Um, and this actually has a mathematical consequence or formulation. What it says is that if you make a matrix out of these ratings, and fill in you know, the positive ones, the negative ones, and then just put zeros for all the ones that are, that are unknown, it says that um, this, the true matrix behind this one, where if you actually filled in all the ratings, must be a low rank matrix. And really the idea of low rank, of course it has a mathematical meaning, it says that a matrix can be written as the product of two others, where the new index that you introduce is, is small. Um, but we can understand that intuitively in this kind of, you know, diagrammatic form as saying that the concept of people and the concept of movies is actually related to some kind of latent concept, some kind of hidden concept or structure. And that's what we call genres. In fact, you could almost even think about it getting a bit philosophical as like um, how we would even like define genres in some sense. 
It's just sort of like some kind of you know, explaining factor that connects other observable concepts. And, and this is true, and this is how it actually recommender systems work at their essence. You take a large matrix and you do some kind of lower rank factorization, like a singular value decomposition on it. And then you can actually um, automatically fill in or discover the missing ratings. Um, so something very similar can actually be done for wave functions. So in a very similar way, um, I'm not gonna you know, prove it to you, but this is something that's been checked thoroughly and I'll mention a proof in a minute about one aspect of it. It turns out that this very forbidding object, this ground state wave function tensor is low rank in a very similar way, but it's not a matrix, it's a tensor. So how do we think about low rankness in terms of tensors? Uh, well, one way you can do it that's, that's very fruitful is you can um, matricize, it, as it's called in the mathematical literature, matricize the tensor. It's sort of like temporarily gathering some of these indices and calling them the row indices for the purpose of, of thinking about a matrix, and gathering the rest and saying they're the column indices. Then imagining putting this into something that computes a low rank factorization like a SVD algorithm in LAPAC, um, computing it and looking at the singular values and seeing if there are only a handful that are significant. And there actually are if it's a ground state in low dimensions, like a one dimensional ground state. Um, so why, let's try to you know, think briefly, why could this be the case? Because it seems kind of impossible that some really big object should factorize so nicely, like where this, this new index that we introduced might only be of size 10 or 100. And we already get a very good description of an arbitrarily big wave function of you know, hundreds and hundreds or thousands of electrons. Um, it's really because, um, first of all, kind of like in this movie analogy that I was making, it's not really possible that properties of one electron can really um, depend precisely on every single four to the n minus one states of all the other electrons. It can't really be carrying about every single possible spin pattern of all the electrons arbitrarily far away. There has to be some simplification that can happen. Um, really what's going on is that electrons mostly correlate with others nearby to them. Um, if we think of there being an electron sort of near this index, really it cares about only a few other electrons over here, like the ones nearby to this cut. And so that, that introduces some kind of constriction mathematically in the wave function. So then one other thing we can observe is that there's nothing really so special about this center by partition. We could say group these two indices as the row indices temporarily, and the rest are as column, and you know, ask about a low rank factorization there, or do the same there. And of course we can move the cut the other way to, to the right. And so really um, what this motivates is like kind of a multi-low rank decomposition. And I'll make these diagrams more precise in a minute where we could gather all these different low rank decompositions together in a self-consistent way. And then just start out by writing um, a many body wave function in this already factorized form and say that really we can just stay there the whole time and work with, with this kind of object. And that will be sufficient to um, handle a wide class of, of interesting quantum many body wave functions. Okay, so let me just briefly introduce this notation. I think a lot of you know it, but I'll just go over it so that um, as I used it in the rest of the talk, it makes sense. So this is a, um, that, uh, this is a notation introduced by Roger Penrose that um, is extremely useful for notating very large tensors. Um, you know, if you think about a tensor with uh, two indices as a matrix and then with three as like a cube of numbers, and then if you have four indices, now you can't even really draw that. So it's helpful to have a different way to, to draw and reason about these. This notation, the way it works is if you have a tensor with an indices, you draw a tensor as some kind of shape. Um, often the shape doesn't matter, but it's just a, a shape that you pick. And then the indices are replaced by lines coming out of the shape. If you like, you can think of these lines as wires that are carrying a kind of a current or some kind of setting. Um, and as you dial these lines to different settings, if you fix all the lines, you're accessing one of the numbers inside the tensor. So you can kind of pick the numbers out one at a time by fixing these lines. And um, Here's how these diagrams look for some familiar um, low order, like order being the number of indices examples. So a vector would just be a shape with one index, a matrix would have two indices, two lines. This is a three index tensor. And then um, the key um, innovation in this notation is that rather than having to write these cumbersome um, kinds of expressions in traditional notation, where you actually have to draw lines to help yourself find pairs of indices that are summed over or contracted over, that line becomes the whole notation. So when, you, when two of these lines meet from different nearby tensors, that means a sum is running on the joined line now. Um, and so then we can see familiar examples like a matrix times a vector becomes this uh, shape with two lines connecting to the shape with one line. And we can immediately see just by inspection that afterward there's one line left over. So we can do kind of a visual proof that uh, a matrix times a vector is, is another vector. Um, and then this diagram, you can see we start dropping the um, names of the indices is 
two matrices and they're joined on both lines, we can see the result as a scalar. And we could even see that um, this is permutation invariant if we sort of bring one of them around this ring. Um, and this is the trace of a product of two, two matrices. So this really starts to pay off when you're dealing with tensor networks, which is just the name for when you have these collections of many different small tensors contracted together, like this one. Um, because this is how this drawing, uh, which is a rigorous mathematical expression, this is how it would look in traditional notation. So it can be really hard if you're reading a paper to come across an expression like this and get an intuition for what's going on. When you see this diagram, it's a lot, a lot easier and a lot quicker to work with. So this um, decomposition, this kind of multi-low rank decomposition of a large tensor has a name, it's called the matrix product state. Um, also, if you look into more recent mathematical literature, it's called their um, tensor train. Um, so it's getting to be used more and more outside of physics actually in things like solving um, differential equations and factorizing tensors appearing in neural network weights and things like that. So it's, it's becoming really quite an interesting topic. But um, this was introduced to physicists um, in the 90s um, following the invention of the DMRG algorithm, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And this is really like kind of the canonical kind of simplest example of a tensor network. Um, it's called a matrix product state because you can think of it as a compressed format for retrieving all the different four to the n elements um, that would be in this wave function tensor. So you can go to this um, matrix product state and say, please give me the um, amplitude in the wave function for observing the state up, down, up, down, down. And by doing that, you're fixing these external or physical indices, the ones that, that label all the states of the wave function. And so now we can think of the resulting tensors as having those indices removed or fixed. And then we see that what's left over is a chain of a vector times a matrix, another matrix, another matrix. Um, and that's something we can do efficiently just by doing these vector matrix multiplies one at a time down and down and down until we've simplified to a scalar and we can retrieve that number. So what we're really doing is we're encoding uh, four to the n different numbers um, through much fewer latent parameters and we're trading off storage for computation. We're saying that instead of storing all these numbers and trying to work that way, we'll just do a very quick computation to, to get each one on request. And actually there's even smarter things you can do than that, but that kind of shows how we can trade these off and, and get some kind of gain. Um, so the most important thing to know about matrix product state tensor networks is that they have this control parameter called the bond dimension. Um, in this math literature, it's called, it's actually called the rank there, the tensor train rank, um, in just close analogy to the, you know, SVD rank or something. Um, so this is the, um, this is the parameter that really um, controls the cost of working with these things, how much storage you'll need, how much computation you'll have to do to work with them. And um, just by doing some counting, you can see that um, each of these tensors has uh, chi-squared ent entries. Um, and then there's, there's n of them for a system of length n. So if you have a system of size n, instead of needing memory four to the n to store this in computation that has to do with four to the n, you only need four times n times chi-squared uh, memory to store. And then typically computations, most interesting computations that we want to do um, scale like chi cubed. So this is very mild scaling. So the, the name of the game is that basically if you can find cases where wave functions can be represented this way with a chi that's only tens or hundreds, maybe thousands, then these are computations that you can do quickly, reasonably on a computer. You can store these, you can compute with these. Um, but it's important to know that you haven't in principle given anything up because you can always represent any state whatsoever, any tensor whatsoever by increasing this chi more and more and more. So you haven't really, um, made an approximation in that sense uh, that, that's uncontrolled. Um, if you take chi to be exponentially large, you can, you can represent any state. But of course, we don't want to have to do that because then we rewrite back to this exponential problem that we were trying to avoid. OK. Um, by the way, there's some writing on the slide. Let me um, see if I can clear that, clear that off one second. Okay. Um, okay, great. I didn't know if other people could see that or not. Yeah, that's gone now. Okay. Miles, um, I, I actually would like to ask a quick question. So this thing that when you increase chi to, you know, four to the n over two, uh, you can represent this, uh, essentially any wave function. I mean, this is something that, of course, works with just counting, but uh, can these be proven rigorously? Um, yes, it can. Mm -hmm. um, you can even take um, 
uh, you could start the other way and, and take sort of small systems where you can do exact diagonalization and then really just take that matrix and, and decompose it. You know, if you could even just put it into LAPAC SVD and you'll just see um, that all the um, singular values are rather significant and there will be four to the n over two of them and then just kind of proceed that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a nice fact because it's very concrete sort of thing. Thanks. So um, what you can do as a, as a refinement of this kind of just, you know, general counting kind of thing is you can relate um, this bond dimension to something that nowadays is considered, you know, a bit more physical. It was a bit exotic when it first sort of came into the field, but now it's sort of uh, been appreciated as something rather physical. You can show very easily that the bond dimension um, chi actually bounds the quantum entanglement between two halves of the system, halves in this kind of 1D bipartition sense for this kind of network. Um, you know, I haven't, I haven't defined the quantum entanglement, but basically this is when you um, look at just the density matrix for one half of the system and um, diagonalize it and um, make an entropy out of its eigenvalues, treating them as probabilities. So you can bound this quantity um, by the log of the bond dimension. So then we can immediately say that um, if something is described by a tensor network, then we're describe what we're describing are low entanglement states. Um, and so then we, of course, hope the other way too, that, that when we go and look at sort of natural states that come up in some setting like low temperature or local interactions, things like this, that these will be low entanglement states. And then we will, will be able to capture them by a tensor network. It's less obvious the other way though. But um, fortunately, in some cases, this has actually been proved. Um, it's been proved specifically by, by Hastings and that, uh, that in one dimension, in a system with finite, you know, governed by a finite range Hamiltonian, that um, ground states and low excited states of, of the system are low entangled states if there's a gap uh, between the ground state or ground states and the first excited state. This has actually been rigorously proven, but then this has also just been amply verified numerically, not only in this setting, but even when this gap closes, this is still approximately true in a practical sense. And um, at least for finite systems, uh, very large ones though. And this also seems to be empirically holding um, in 2D. Um, it can hold even when the interactions are further neighbor and long range. Um, these are more proximate and not proven statements though. But this is just sort of widely holds for the case of ground states empirically and in some cases, you know, provably. So um, we now know that basically um, ground states of quantum many body systems are tensor networks or very close to tensor networks. And this can all be refined much further through concepts um, I don't have time to get into about what's called the uh, area law or boundary law of scaling of entanglement and refinements of that um, corrections to entanglement scaling. Um, and there's like a very beautiful article by Glenn Evan Blue and Giffrey Vidal um, uh, and that, that will go over this and kind of lays this whole theory out that I highly recommend. So um, this, act, this can actually means that tensor networks can be applied to the Hubbard model, which is the topic of all these lectures, um, you know, at least in the ground state. And then I'll be going into a little bit of how we can go beyond this too. How do we deal with it at finite temperature? And um, it actually works well, in fact, so this is a very general statement, right? There's nothing here about strength of interactions or strong correlation or anything like that. So it turns out this works for actually all U and not only for all U, in fact, um, best for large U, but it holds even to um, small or moderate U as well. Um, and this just holds very generally for a lot of interesting systems in physics. And as we'll see later in the talk, it can be applied even at um, finite temperature as well, even though this proof is really just about ground states. Um, but there's still some challenge, uh, many challenges remaining, of course, um, having to do with, say, studying more dynamical properties of quantum systems, and in particular, dealing with higher dimensional systems. That this proof by Hastings has to do with 1D Hamiltonians. Things are working well still in 2D, as we'll hear about even more from Alex, but that's still a big frontier for these methods, too. This, this story I told you about matrix product states is a rather 1D story. There's extensions called uh, PEPs, which are truly 2D, but the um, costs of working with them remain really high, and the, and the methods are still being uh, developed and matured. Um, but in general, this is now a very rich field. So in addition to this uh, matrix product state that I talked about a bit just now, there's, there's many other different formats. These are just a few of them that each have their own expressive power, um, associated algorithms and theory that can go with them. And this field is bearing a lot of fruit, um, not only numerically, but also theoretically, there's been um, full classifications of certain classes of systems in terms of tensor networks, understandings of concepts like topological order, um, and many other things are still continuing to come out of this field. Um, so now let me just say a few words about um, 
you may wonder, okay, this is all kind of on, from a formal point of view. A little more practically, how do we actually put the numbers into a tensor network? So we um, can claim that we can represent the uh, wave function this way, but we actually have to you know, do some calculations. So how, do, how are these actually done? And I'll just talk briefly about two different ways these are done. So the first one is the simplest to implement actually. And um, I'll mention it too, because this ties into the idea of using tensor networks at finite temperature, which is where I'll, where I'll conclude the talk to like kind of link to the next talk. Um, and this is the scheme of, of doing imaginary time evolution. It's a kind of a ground state projection method. The idea is you start with some kind of initial state, which could be most, you know, almost anything. It just needs to not be orthogonal to the ground state that you're looking for. And then you take your Hamiltonian and you exponentiate it with a, with a imaginary time parameter tau, and then you act on this, this state and you try to take tau large. And it's easy to show that if tau is taken large enough, that the resulting state psi tau for large tau will be um, the dominant eigenstate of your Hamiltonian, it will be the ground state. So that's the idea behind it. Um, and it's also easy mathematically to apply or to exponentiate H when this um, tau is small. So you can just do this in small pieces where you take a little bit at a time, which I'm calling epsilon here and then do this over and over and over again. And then also if your Hamiltonian is um, local or short range, you can break this down even further using what's called a trotterization where you just exponentiate each of the terms individually. And that's just like exponentiating a small matrix. So that's easy to do. Um, and then I'm just showing here just kind of a sketch of how this works. You start with some kind of simple state like a factorized product state. And then you're just basically contracting these three tensors together, this one, this one, this one. And then you, um, just do a simple matrix factorization. And when you're done with that, you have these two matrices. You see here, there's two lines coming out of each of them. So you just are multiplying some tensors together, you know, uh, treating the result as a matrix, calling a matrix factorization. And then now you've basically put in a bond here, uh, this one of these low rank constrictions that I mentioned earlier. And now you can do the same on this next bond and the next and the next. So you're always just touching a handful of tensors at a time and just doing matrix factorizations. But when you're done with all of this, you've actually um, taken one small step in imaginary time. And then you can do this over and over again. And each time you can find that as you do these factorizations, these internal indices in the network will grow automatically. So it's adaptive and it's actually um, adjusting automatically to always have the kind of minimal parameters needed to represent these low entanglement states um, that you'll approach as you go to uh, infinite imaginary time or into the ground state. So that, that will actually be a tool that, that you know, Alex will be using a more sophisticated version in the talk he's, he'll be giving next. There's actually something even more efficient you can do if you're working at zero temperature. I'll just give a very brief sketch of this, this idea. And this is really the idea that, that 30 years ago kicked off this field in physics um, in a big way. This is the idea called density matrix renormalization group algorithm. Um, and this takes the point of view more of finding the parameters by thinking of the problem as a variational problem. Um, for normalized wave function psi, here written as an MPS, we can write the energy, you know, psi h psi this way as this network. So you can see this as a scalar because all the indices are contracted with, with another index. And we want to minimize this energy. This is the object we like to minimize. Um, but we don't want to have to take all these parameters on at once. So we just want to take uh, these tensors one at a time and optimize them uh, one at a time. And then we'll just be alternating which one we optimize back and forth. And so what you can do without going way into the details is you can basically say, okay, we'll focus on this tensor um, as the one being optimized and hold the rest fixed. These other ones are temporarily fixed at this step. And then we'll pull it off of the network. And then I've also removed its other um, dual copy over here. And you can show that this resulting network acts like an effective Hamiltonian for this single tensor. You can even see it kind of looks like the letter H right here. Um, so this is the original Hamiltonian, kind of the bare Hamiltonian. <laughs> Um, projected into the fixed parameters, you can think of them as a fixed, temporarily fixed basis of the rest of the network, um, projecting down just to the space that's needed to describe the wave function in terms of these parameters here. So really this is the entire wave function, the entire mini body wave function here, um, just that when you put it back, it's like expanding it back into the full Hilbert space through these other tensors that are held fixed. Um, and, and even though this looks kind of forbidding, this whole network can be computed very efficiently, very quickly on the computer. And then you can take this effective Hamiltonian and just put it into like an exact diagonalization code or package, um, do some steps of exact diagonalization to very rapidly improve the parameters in this tensor and then put it back and then move on to the next one. And so you have a scheme where you're sweeping back and forth over the tensors, I'm just showing the first three here and improving them one at a time. 
Um, this is very efficient and fast. I'll show a movie on this slide of this being done for the 1D Heisenberg model, which is like a cousin of the Hubbard model. It's the limit actually um, when the interactions are cranked up to be arbitrarily large and the electrons don't move anymore, but their spins can still move. Um, this will show what a DMRG calculation looks like pretty much in real time on the computer and essentially how fast it actually goes. This is a chain of uh, hundred spin and halves. So this is how it actually looks when you do this, starting from a random state. So that's the first sweep. The second sweep, you can kind of see the um, anti-ferromagnetic correlations. This is showing the magnetization. And then you can see that this is very accurate, even when things are very converged um, and the magnetization goes to zero as it should for the correct ground state, even at the end, it's still putting on very tiny refinements. Um, I didn't figure out in the movie yet how to show the energy as, a, you know, as a part of the animation. But if you could see the energy, um, even, in the, even as you do more and more sweeps, it's basically um, converging exponentially quickly and putting on one digit after another digit after another digit of accuracy. So in this 1D setting, which is kind of the home turf for DMRG, it's incredibly fast and accurate way of, of calculating ground states. Okay, so um, now in my remaining time, let me talk about um, uh, at least one very interesting scheme of how to put uh, finite temperature into tensor networks. So um, well, let me just say a few words about it first, right? So, so um, you know, finite temperature uh, in some, from the point of view of some methods, it's the thing you actually would like to get out of your calculation. Because if you're used to doing something like quantum Monte Carlo, this is the thing that um, you're trying to always push down to lower and lower temperature. Um, but that's the thing that you can't do necessarily because um, things start to scale exponentially. But a lot of the most interesting physics actually happens still at a um, kind of low, but not all the way zero temperature. Because there you can um, see how things cross over to moderate temperature physics um, or connects to high temperature. Also, things can become a lot more generic. Um, you know, we write down these very simple toy models uh, to try to understand strongly correlated electron physics models like the Hubbard model. We don't always want the kind of sharp corners or particularities of the model that we chose to always uh, dominate everything as they might in the ground state. So by introducing a little bit of temperature, we can get a bit more of a universal picture of what, what electrons might really do across a class of systems, something like that. So if you're um, starting from this point of view of you know, the Schrodinger equation and zero temperature, and then you say, okay, we found the ground state, it's an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. Then you say, how are we gonna put in finite temperature? You might open up a, a textbook on quantum stat mech and look and say, well, what's the textbook prescription of what to do? Well, it'll tell you, okay, just obtain all the eigenstates. Um, and then once you have the, all the eigenstates, the Hamiltonian is diagonal in that basis. So that's a really nice basis to work in. And then when you want to uh, describe a finite temperature state of a quantum system, which you can think of as just being this matrix formed by exponentiating H, it's nice because it's diagonal. So then it's easy to, um, do this exponentially. You just exponentiate all the eigenvalues, which are the energies of the individual eigenstates. Um, if you want to compute thermal averages, say of an operator A, then you just um, trace with this, this matrix and these wrap around the operator and you just have this sum and, and everything is very nice and easy. But um, this is definitely uh, pretty deceptive. So first of all, there's exponentially many eigenstates. So are you really gonna obtain all of them? But even worse than that, they behave very terribly numerically for the most part. The ground state is really rather special and the low-lying excited states are also pretty well behaved. But um, once you work at kind of arbitrary temperatures and you're bringing in a large number of, of eigenstates, things can get really bad on the computer. Uh, for one thing, generically, eigenstates are spaced uh, very close together. There's, a very, there's an exponentially small energy spacing between most of them. Um, also, this one is more, be more of a conceptual problem. But we know that like at high temperatures, things become classical, but I can say it's don't behave that way. They're very non-classical, even at high T. Um, more precisely, they have very high entanglement generically. In fact, they have really something very close to the thing that Antoine asked about this, this four to the N over two bond dimension, if you tried representing them as a tensor network, very generically at moderate and high temperatures, meaning, meaning the eigenstates that you would access with high probability at some kind of moderate temperature. So from this point of view, tensor networks are a kind of a niche topic. They're really good for ground states, maybe in low dimensions, but there's no hope for um, putting, you know, applying them at finite temperature and we should just switch to something else if you really took this textbook view of things. Um, but it turns out that you can be more creative and think about things from a different point of view. And this, this was work by Steve White in 2009 um, that developed that he developed this uh, very beautiful METS algorithm that I'll describe to you now. So what you can do is you can, come at the um, finite temperature density matrix, this object, uh, in a different way. 
you can say, first of all, let's write it as its square root times a square root. This is just a, a way of starting off to keep things symmetric so we can introduce a kind of a symmetric pure state decomposition. Then you just um, insert a complete resolution of the identity. Here, I'm just putting in a sum i. This runs over exponentially many states, some kind of full basis of the Hilbert space. And then I'm just inserting that here. Um, and we're actually free to choose these i any way we want at this step. But what we've done is we've now uh, written this um, mixed state, this big matrix, as a sum of pure states. Um, and I haven't said much about the properties of these yet or, or really chosen them to be anything in particular. If we chose these to be the eigenstates, we would uh, be right back to an expression like this. Um, so that, that's one particular example of this kind of thing. But um, we don't have to choose them to be eigenstates. We have this freedom to choose these states i to be anything we want. And then these um, states phi that we're expanding the density matrix in are, um, you can think of them as the thermalization of i. So I take a state i, some kind of pure state that I come up with, and then I thermalize it by sort of pushing it down in temperature. Um, and I'm working at a temperature T, which is related to this factor beta. It's just more convenient on these slides to use uh, the coolness beta. And then um, the two is just because I'm always going to use two of these things when I compute observables. So you can think of it as like the square root of the density matrix. So these are like little square root pieces of the density matrix, little shards of the density matrix. And then by kind of adding up all these shards, I get back the whole, the whole thing. Um, so this is how it looks if I would actually be a little more precise about some of these factors. And if I want to compute an observable, some, some operator A, then what I will do is trace with this density matrix. And writing it in this form means I take all these little pure state shards and I sum over all of them with some appropriate weights that are, I, I can compute. And um, what I really am doing is I'm, I'm taking these pure state snapshots at finite temperature and averaging over them with appropriate weights. This is a very generic thing you can, you can write down for, for density matrices of this type. Um, so that's the expansion we want to pursue. But then what we're going to be doing is taking some kind of pure states, pushing them down in temperature, thermalizing them. Um, and we hope that, at the, that as we do this, this thermalizing and at the end of doing it, that we end up something, with something that has low entanglement, something that we can manage. So then intuitively, what would be the smartest thing to do is start with something that has the least entanglement of all, just a product state, an unentangled product state. And there's different families of these, but you know, basically they're, they're all pretty simple. We just, we just have orbitals or sites, and then we just have the electrons doing something only on that single site and no entanglement between them at all. And we're free to choose that as our initial states i because they do make a complete basis of the whole Hubert space. And then the hope is that if, if we kind of give um, our tensor networks a head start or a fighting chance by starting with zero entanglement, then as we thermalize, maybe the entanglement will remain something manageable. That's the idea. And that's the picture of making these, these shards, these little um, factorized states. As you start with something a product, you thermalize by applying e to the minus beta over 2h. And then hopefully, even for pretty large beta, you'll always stay to something modestly entanglement, uh, modestly entangled. And that, that's indeed the case. And I showed on an earlier slide, in fact, this is something that you do sometimes in a single shot to try to find the ground state. You do imaginary time projection um, where you try to take beta all the way to infinity, something very large to get to the ground state. So we have a reasonable expectation this will work in general because you know, this ground state projection works no, pretty much no matter what starting state you choose. And the entanglement usually just grows monotonically until you get to the ground state value. And as I told you on an earlier slide, ground states are modestly entangled too, at least for a wide class of the system. So everything should be good here. We should start with zero entanglement, go to modest entanglement, and then finally end up with at most the ground state value, which has been proven to be something tensor networks can handle. So that's, that's the idea here. Um, so we've, we've kind of solved that problem. That, that way that the, this exponential could creep back in, this, this part of the mini body problem at finite temperature, this entanglement side of it. There'd be one other problem, which is that even if you could convince yourself that these are modestly entangled things that individually I can make and deal with as a tensor network by choosing these initial kind of seed states to be product states, I'd have one other problem. There's too many of them, right? So there's exponentially many different product states. And this prescription looks like I just have to sum over all of them. So that doesn't look too good. But what's, what's neat is that you can write down a very beautiful um, Markov chain um, that tells you once you've made one of these, how to pick the next one in a very intelligent way that always leads you toward states of high probability, but in a um, balanced way that also satisfies detailed balance so that you're guaranteed in the end, if you do a kind of sampling to get the correct thermal average um, as you do this more and more and more. And I won't have time to go away into the details. Alex will recap over this a little bit too. 
but basically there's a nice sampling scheme that's very intuitive for you. You take an arbitrary um, initial product state, you thermalize it, meaning evolve an imaginary time for some precise value. Then um, you can compute your physical observables, just a, a piece of them by you know, computing their properties in this state. Um, then what you do is a collapse very much like what you would do as if you had prepared the state on a quantum computer. And then your states of your electrons were like bits and you're actually observing them. They collapse when you observe them into some definite state. Um, and we can do this collapse efficiently on the classical computer too, and then get a new product state that results from this collapse, a new seed state, then thermalize again, then do another collapse. And you can mathematically prove that just this simple collapse, just this simple Born rule collapse is actually the right thing to get the correct thermal averages if you, if you run this chain. So it's just a very nice uh, picture of, of what finite temperature is like. It's like things are kind of getting moderately entangled and then something comes in from outside and disturbs them then they're left alone a little while to kind of get entangled again. But how entangled they get is always related to the temperature. So if the temperature is high, they only get a little entangled. Things are pretty classical. If the temperature is low, they get much more entangled, but only to the ground state. So it's, it's pretty intuitive, a nice picture, but it's also mathematically rigorous. And it's also a powerful computational tool. So it has all these really great different aspects. Um, this picture of, of thermal physics is called the METS algorithm. There's a more general concept um, called typical thermal states this idea of kind of thermal state typicality. And this is the um, minimally entangled formulation of it, which is appropriate for tensor networks. So um, this, this, this idea was coined by Steve, Steve White um, in 2009, this, this METS algorithm. So you can, in the end, think of it as a kind of uh, blending of quantum Monte Carlo and tensor network ideas. But unlike you know, traditional quantum Monte Carlo, where you go all the way to a path integral where the samples are classical configurations, these samples are actually lightly entangled wave functions. So you're actually uh, sampling over fully entangled, you know, many body wave functions, but which are just kind of moderately entangled so you can deal with them. Um, and the classicality really depends on T, as I mentioned. So when you're sampling at high temperature, it really just looks like classical Monte Carlo again. Low temperature, it just looks like computing the ground state over and over, and then at moderate temperature, something in between. So um, I'll, I'll end on this part just by showing a movie so you can have some intuition for this. This is a, a nice movie that, that Steve White made showing um, a spin half Heisenberg ladder, just a little toy example, where we'll make one of these states one at a time and show their properties. So this, these arrows will be showing the orientation of the spin instantaneously. These bonds are showing the, um, the value of the S dot S Heisenberg interaction between pairs of spins. If it's blue, that means it's happy. It means it's anti-ferromagnetic. If it's red, it means it's unhappy, it's high energy. It means it's ferromagnetic, the spins are, are aligned, which this, this term um, does not favor. And um, the size will show the, the value and so on. But even though this just looks like an animation or movie, these are actually um, quantum states you can store in the computer and averaging over them rigorously gives you um, correct thermal averages numerically. So this is actually a powerful computational tool as well as a movie. So here's the movie showing thermalizing the first state and making the first METs. There, there it is. Um, and because this is at pretty low temperature, it resembles the ground state. All the energies are pretty balanced. Then we do the collapse back to some arbitrary product state and then thermalize again to make the second METS. And we can see because it's um, at pretty low temperature, things are getting quantum. The spins are shrinking. They're, we have a, a, you know, it's heading toward having an average magnetization of zero of any given spin. Um, we can collapse again and make the next METS and so on. And for a system that size, it may take about that much time, maybe a little bit more time than that. Um, but these are very efficient calculations. Okay. So um, I'll end there just by saying that um, tensor networks are um, you know, a really wide ranging idea that succeed because um, of, of low entanglement structures in quantum states. And so you know, basically the punchline of the talk was to say that you know, if you read a lot of the literature on, on this, you would be led to think that low entanglement only happens at zero temperature, but it's also since been realized that, that low entanglement is really everywhere, even at finite temperature. You just have to view finite temperature systems in the right way. Um, the nice thing about tensor networks is we can really avoid these exponential costs that, that come in with other methods, either say at large interactions like you in the Hubbard model or at low temperatures that can happen. We can really avoid almost all of these, at least for low dimensional systems. But then the big um, frontier is moving um, away from 1D quasi 2D systems really into fully 2D systems. And then you know, one day, hopefully pretty soon, 3D systems, that's already starting to happen in fact. And so um, finite temperature is treatable with tensor networks by avoiding the concept of energy eigenstates and working instead with 
these kind of low entanglement typical states. Um, so as I mentioned, the real frontier is two and 3D and um, zero temperature methods have been really well developed now. And we have now these nice finite temperature approaches, approaches but they have been kind of underused. So one activity we have at CCQ is really now trying to harness these and put a lot of numerical power and expertise behind them and applying them to interesting systems like the Hubbard model in 2D um, with the goal of really having like a coherent um, unified understanding of systems like the Hubbard model and strongly correlated electrons where we can really connect high and low temperature and talk to other numerical methods as well. So um, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Miles. This was a beautiful introduction to the field and also a glimpse into future directions.